was actually very strange because uh, people look at me now <laughs> and they don't know the, the background to all of this. Growing up, I was the middle child in the first place, the odd one out. Uh, everyone else was sort of extroverted and, you know, the family was close and I was always the outsider, the one that they didn't understand. So I had a very low self-esteem when I grew up. And funny enough, I was the one who was uh, the brightest of my siblings, but that didn't even make much of a difference because my mother used to say, you know, life in Anglico is not all about academics. You know, you have to be wise in the ways of life. So I thought, I'm not wise in the ways of life, and so I'm not gonna make it in life kind of thing. Everybody was just worried about me. But my father was the one who was my strength in the family because each time I did well, he would be so pleased with me. He would slaughter a sheep. He would tell everyone. I stayed in a small town, I'm Tata. So it was one street. He would take me to town and everywhere down this, that street, he would say, do you know my, my daughter passed excellently standard five or whatever. So it was a mixture of that, but my mother thing was had a big impact on my self-esteem. Anyway, so I didn't know what I wanted to do. My father kept you know, uh, saying I needed to be a doctor because I was the bright one. And I toyed with the idea because I didn't know. I mean, as a child, you don't really know. We don't come here with a script of what you're supposed to do, who you're supposed to be, and what are you supposed to, to do here. And um, so I took a, a gap here. During that time, I went with my mother on, you know, they were running uh, clinics in the rural areas. So what this one holiday, I went with, with her before I took this gap here. Pondering again, what do I want to do? And um, at the end of that holiday, I was very, very clear. Dad, I don't want to be a doctor. I am definitely not a doctor. That holiday was a torture for me. Just looking at these people, I didn't have the kind of compassion that doctors need to have. So I was clear, I'm not a doctor. What am I then? Fortunately, then I took this gap here. My father had just acquired this panel beating shop. Things were opening up in the trans guy for black people and I was exposed to a formalish business for the first time because before I was working in the shops, you know, uh, and all of that. So I was exposed to chartered accountancy, uh, Professor Ngushu's firm were our auditors, and uh, I enjoyed that, you know. I was sort of the bookkeeper in the business and there was an accountant, I was learning a lot from this accountant, and I realized this is what I want to do. I, I enjoy this. So I went back to my father and I said, well, that's now I know what I want to do. I, I want to do a big home, that's what I said. So he said, okay, because he was always of the view that I want my children to be free thinkers. So he asked me, what is the highest level that you can be in this field of yours? And I said, a chartered accountant. And he said, exactly, that's what you want to be. So. I then knew that, you know, I, that's what I wanted to do. But what I want to say is, you, you would look at this story and, and people always ask, how did you do the things that you've done? But they don't realize, it's how I was socialized, you know? It's the kind of family I grew up in. I grew up in a family of entrepreneurs. My parents were in business, my uncles were in business. I grew up in Amtata during those days of independence where black people were, you know, acquiring sort of formalish businesses like wholesalers and garages. So I had a lot of inspiration seeing black people who were successful in business. That's why I could have the kind of dreams that I had. But even in the family itself, my, both my parents were very strong, strong personalities, both of them. <laughs> they used to fight all the time because of that. <laughs> Um, so my mother used to, you know, tell us these stories about black Americans. Look at the black Americans. You know, they are succeeding. You can be anything that you, you want to be. And um, my father was very passionate about education. You know, I, don't, I won't go in his story about avoiding education. So he wanted to make sure that his children 
because he was the brightest in the family and his father hoped he would go to university and he ducked. So he wanted to make sure that he would get a good education. But uh, because we were growing up with these strong parents, my, my father really is responsible for who I became because he was this strong man. He was a big man with presence and who was such a fighter. He would not allow anything to stand in his way. He used to you know, tell us these stories of his battles in business uh, around the, the dinner table or in his bedroom at night. And he used to say, uh, it's, English doesn't do it justice, but uh, who can stand in front of a bus? You know, I'll be a bus to you. And, and so uh, that's how I was socialized. I mean, I remember a story where they had gone into homeopathic medicines and, and they were being fought by the uh, mainstream medical doctors using government to fight them. So eventually they had to go to court and there was this big court of my father versus the state around this thing and he, he won. So, you know, for me, that's how I see life. Nothing is impossible. Uh, I have a father who is in the statutes, Goboto versus the state. But it is just so important that we understand the history of South Africa, that we need to get people uh, socialized differently, you know, because socialization is just a, such a big issue. It's also a pity that we don't realize that education is the one that can make a difference in our country. I got to where I got to because of education, and I became a chartered accountant because my father was in business. I got exposed to, the, uh, to this profession. Otherwise, I wouldn't have even known that there was such a profession. So, now I knew what I wanted. You know, I could go to university when all of the other children were students were playing around at varsity saying, no, no, let's not be that serious. We can do this thing over five years. I was like to them, no, 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 I'm very sorry. I don't have five years to do this. I'm here to do my BCom because my dream is to be a chartered accountant. So knowing what you want actually focuses you in life. And so I uh, then went on to, to do articles with, with KPMG. And I qualified, I, I won't tell you when, <laughs> it was a long time ago. But I didn't know that I would be the first black woman chartered accountant in South Africa because there were others who had returned before me, you know. And for me, that was not even important because all I wanted was to be a chartered accountant because I wanted to succeed in life and I knew that getting a, a prestigious qualification like that would position me well in terms of the dreams that I had. And so that then the results came out and um, yeah, you have to hear that story. So the results come out, they, they, they just touch us the whole day. Results come out at four. So the whole day, you're sitting there, you can't even work, you're waiting for this four o'clock, this four o'clock. And then Doug Southgate, who was my um, partner at KPMG at the time, and who was actually my mentor, Doug was really such a mentor for me. Uh, the results actually came to our East London office. So uh, Doug gave me the phone, and the guy said, congratulations, that's all he needed to say. I, I'm told through the receiver uh, in the dustbin, I ran out screaming around the office. People were wondering what has happened. <laughs> My mother's died. And that was the story. I had actually made it. I mean, you must understand this thing is a torture. Just starting to become a chartered accountant is such a difficult thing. Uh, you don't have a life. I was so determined to pass it the first time because I've watched people doing it the second time, the third time. I was like, there's no way I'm going through that uh, four or five times. And my father was so worried about me because I was so determined I'm going to pass first attempt. And he was sort of cautioned, I'm like, you know that when you write an exam, you may pass or, or fail because they thought I'm gonna die <laughs> if I don't pass. But anyway, it was all over. It was just such a relief. So I didn't know that I was the first because there were others who had returned before me. It only transpired the following day, actually, when Saika, our institute, then uh, came with the story that I was actually the first. Okay, that came with a lot of other complications that I didn't realize. Because then suddenly, overnight, I was a celebrity. Overnight, you know, people were descending to my small town in Amtata. 
SAPC, newspapers, magazines, and I was a bit overwhelmed by all of this. And I was like, no guys, you know, I did this for me and I don't need all this drama. But you know, this, this one guy from the SAPC, I'll never forget. He said, this is not about you, you know, because we need role models for others. And from that time I realized it's really not about me. We do need role models and I've been such a role model to so many young people, so many women, which is really great.